Let me tell you a little about Frank Gaffney. It's very difficult to cut this introduction down to size because he's done so many things. Um, Frank is the founder and president of the Center for Security Policy in Washington, D.C. This is a not-for-profit, nonpartisan educational corporation that was established in 1988. It's been nationally and internationally recognized as a source for timely, informed, and penetrating analyses of foreign and defense policy matters. Frank has a radio program. He's the host of Secure Freedom Radio. Um, it's nationally syndicated. It's uh, with Salem, but it's not available in this market on the radio, but it is on the internet. Um, and I think when I'm in Washington, you're in between Hugh Hewitt and who else? Dennis Prager. Dennis Prager. So <laughs> you can see he's in good company. And pick it up on the web if you can. Who knows? Maybe someday we'll have it here on the radio. Nine at night. Nine at night. What's the website to pick it up? Uh, 1260wrc.com. 1260wrc and he'll tell you about that later, I suppose, if you want to know. Um, so he's on, he's on the radio. Featured guests have included Newt Gingrich, John Bolton, many current and former policymakers, and elected officials. My first conscious recollection of reading Frank's work was when our National AFIO Association for Intelligence Officers Journal published a long synopsis of uh, a book put out by the um, Center for Security Policy called War Footing. Uh, Frank was the lead author. It's 10 Steps America Must Take to Prevail in the War for the Free World. And it's the Naval Institute Press, which I read a lot, a lot of their publications. And the foreword is by former CIA Director James Woolsey, introduction, introduction by Victor Davis Hanson, always a wonderful person to read contributions from about 32 other authors. Uh, you'll know some of the names, others you won't. Um, an owner's manual for the new global conflict. Um, and uh, it's a wonderful publication. And Frank, tonight we'll discuss the Center for Security Policy's new publication, which is in his book here today, um, Sharia, the Threat to America, here today. He'll talk about it here today. Now, after reading War Footing, I ran into Frank in an AFIO National Symposium in Washington, and we had a long talk over lunch, and I got to find out, find out that he's a really warm, wonderful person, and he'll listen to everyone's ideas, even mine. Um, now, if you want to read Frank's publications, he's practically everywhere. Uh, he's a weekly columnist for The Washington Times, townhall.com, jewishworldreview.com, contributor to National Review Online. His col columns appear pe uh, periodically, in worldnetdaily.com, the New York Post, Front Page Magazine, many other places. Um, his articles have appeared in the Wall Street Journal, USA Today, the New Republic, even the Washington Post and the New York Times. Um, I don't know what he said there and if they're still publishing and stuff, but hopefully they are. <laughs> Commentary Magazine, and if you have never read Commentary Magazine, please find it and read it. I highly recommend it. Um, now, Frank has worked in the government. He was Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Policy um, under President Reagan. It's the senior position in the it's a senior position in the Defense Department with responsibility for policies involving nuclear forces, arms control, and U.S. European defense relations. Um, he was also uh, he represented the Secretary of Defense in key U.S. Soviet negotiations and ministerial meetings. And he was Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Nuclear Forces and Armed Control Policy under Assistant Secretary Richard Pearl. Um, he was also a professional staff member on the Senate Armed Services Committee uh, under John, Senator John Powers. And he served as aide to the late Senator Henry Scoop Jackson, uh, a person whose ilk does not appear anymore on the, in the Democratic Party, in the areas of defense and foreign policy. Frank holds a master's degree a uh, Master of Arts degree in International Studies from Johns Hopkins School University School of Advanced International Studies and a Bachelor of Science in Foreign Service from Georgetown School of Foreign Service. Uh, his leadership has been recognized by numerous organizations including the Department of Defense Dink Distinguished Public Service Award, the U.S. Business and Industry Council's Defender of the National Interest Award, and what really impresses me, the Navy League of the United States Alfred Thayer Mahan Literary Achievement Award. That's because I'm retired Navy, so there's some other retired Navy people here and 
with us today, and the Zionist Organization of America's Louis Brandeis Award. Now, some of us heard Frank speak at Grace Church earlier in the year. Uh, some people came up to me and told me they were in the audience there, um, and we were really blown away. Others of us heard him at an AFIO, local AFIO chapter luncheon. He is erudite, engaging. His topic is very frightening and very realistic, and we need to listen to him. Frank Gaffney. Thank you for that uh, exceedingly generous um, uh, introduction, Michael, and to all of you. I'm just going to hand this to you to turn off here. I think I'll freak out if I don't. Um, I normally wander around, but since there are cameras, I, it'll make their lives difficult if I don't stay put. And also, I'm going to work from this, so um, indulge me by staying fixed into your seats as well, if you would. Um, it's great to be here. I appreciate enormously uh, both Beverly and, and Michael's uh, efforts and all of the rest of the sponsors and all of your efforts to be here on fairly short notice and in such great numbers. I trust that that means you're interested in the topic. Let me just be clear. This is not the same Sharia as that Sharia, okay? <laughs> I consider this Sharia to be part of the solution to that Sharia. Okay? Just so we're absolutely clear up front. I'll get that out of the way. Imagine my surprise when I was told that I was being sponsored by Sharia. Um, I also want to say it's not every day that a lowly mortal like myself has as a warm-up act Newt Gingrich. So I just want to say, I particularly appreciate the efforts that were made to uh, arrange that. That actually was not, I don't think, uh, based on my reconstruction of the events um, done that long ago. It probably was in August or so, because he refers to a speech that he was about to give in September of this year. Which, by the way, if you haven't seen it, it's available online. It's an absolutely terrific address on this same basic topic, among others. Um, I've been following Newt for a long time, as I imagine most of you have, uh, and he's getting better and better in terms of both just the sheer brilliance of what he says, which has always been pretty impressive, but I think the way he's putting a lot of this stuff together in a, uh, in a very compelling way. He also was very kind enough to uh, make a film just recently, which I sort of think of as the companion piece to this book, um, which we have, did anybody mention this for sale up here? <laughs> um, good. It's called America at Risk, and it's a really superb documentary that he produced with his wife Callista on this same subject. And um, if you're not into reading, I can sit through an hour or so of a video, I commend it to you. Um, better yet, read the book, and then take the video course as well. I'm going to give you a short course on the book uh, today. Uh, it is probably a good idea just to introduce why we call it the Team B2 report. Um, that is a reference to something that came along at an early stage in my professional life and was a very formative experience for me. It was um, an initiative of, of all people, George Herbert Walker Bush when he was the director of central intelligence, long before he came to be vice president or president. Um, under Jerry Ford, who appointed him, he served in that capacity for several years. And early in his tenure, a friend of mine, by the name of Johnny Foster apparently, got to him before the CIA bureaucracy did, and said, George, don't you think it would be a good idea to get a second opinion from a group of outside experts about this thing called detente. Anybody remember detente? Oh, yeah. okay, you're of a certain age, good. Um, Cold War, Soviet Union, Richard Nixon, Henry Kissinger, Jerry Ford thought that instead of this sort of endless struggle 
you know, with Soviet communism, wouldn't it be better if we could all just get along? As Rodney King famously said. <laughs> and they came up with this idea that uh, if we just gave them political concessions, technology, economic assistance, even cut them a wide slack on the strategic things that they were doing that were actually pretty unfriendly to us, that maybe they would leave us alone. Or maybe we'd even, you know, get to be good buddies. So, apparently not knowing better, George Bush let some guys who thought this was a very dubious idea come into the CIA, get access to all the classified information about the Soviet threat and their doctrine and their ambitions and ultimately the kinds of analyses that flowed from that data that came to be part of what are known as the national intelligence estimates, something that the AFIO members of the room will be very familiar with. These national intelligence estimates are supposed to inform policy and at the time they were saying this is a really good idea, the state time thing. So the second opinion that was provided by these guys when they were brought in to look at all that was an opportunity to sort of take stock and evaluate this and calculate whether you know, it really did make sense. Team B is how it came to be called in contrast with Team A, the government position on daytime. And Team B said, this is really nuts. This doesn't make any sense at all. What you're actually doing by engaging in this kind of detente is appeasement of people who respond badly to that kind of behavior. They think it actually is an inducement to worse behavior, not a disincentive, let alone something that causes them to shout kumbaya. What's really important about this, folks, is that that was not just a flash in the pan, just another of innumerable studies that get done by people, some more distinguished than others, some better than others, frankly. But there was a guy you probably have also heard of by the name of Ronald Reagan. Does that name ring a bell? Okay, just checking. Um, it says CBR after all that. Uh, Ronald Reagan actually believed detente was nuts. But what he was able to benefit from in the form of this authoritative, albeit highly classified analysis, was something that he could point to that enabled him to say, you see, it's not just me. It's people who know what they're talking about who believe that if you reward bad behavior, you'll get more of it. And if anything, you induce the Soviet Union to think that communism actually will triumph over all of us. Well, they'll work harder to make that so. He took that sort of line of reasoning backed by this authoritative analysis, and he ran against Gerald Ford in 1976. Remember that? Mm -hmm. Almost beat him in the primaries. Four years later, he did beat Jimmy Carter, also on the platform that what Jimmy Carter was doing with detente with the Soviet Union, though he tried to sort of back away from it after that unpleasantness about Afghanistan, was still nuts. And most importantly, Ronald Reagan took the Team B intellectual architecture and he used it to beat the Soviet Union in the years of his presidency. And the rest, as they say, is history.